have with me Harshwadhan Shringla, who is the former Foreign Secretary of India. He joins me right now on the telecast. Thank you so much, Mr. Harshwadhan, for joining me. And my first question to you, what to your knowledge was the sovereign status of Kacha, Kacha Thivu at the point of independence back in 1947? Kacha Thivu has, in some senses, always been a point of discussion uh, between uh, India and Sri Lanka. In that time, the Indian dominion of the British, uh, you know, empire and uh, the Ceylon dominion. And at that time, I think uh, the British, considering the historic and legal evidence available, decided to leave Kacha Thivu within India. In other words, they did not agree to transfer Kacha Thivu to Sri Lanka. And what are the evidences? One, of course, is the uh, fact that, uh, you know, the Zamindar or the Raja of uh, Ramanathapuram or, uh, you know, was, collect was, uh, was collecting uh, tax and those revenue records are available. The second is some court judgment in 1906 or something. In 1913, there was a report by the British Indian government which basically said that Kachatibu belonged to the Raja of Ramnathapuram and uh, and was a territory, was a part of India. So given all this evidence, I think uh, the British also decided not to uh, transfer uh, Kachatibu to Ceylon, then Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Uh, and so uh, if you look at it from that perspective, it is surprising that in 1974, uh, the Congress government of, uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi uh, took the decision to, um, you know, um, actually uh, demarcate uh, Kachatibu in favor of Sri Lanka. Uh, and we, if you look at the fact that Kachatibu is a mere 12 nautical miles from the Indian coastline, uh, you know, you are really giving uh, a part of uh, uh, your uh, territory uh, to another country, which basically is very in close proximity to your, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, littoral uh, space. Uh, and there are uh, severe economic and uh, uh, strategic and security concerns that have emerged. I think the fact that the documents that have been released uh, bring out uh, in great detail the sort of implications, uh, you know, the, the, of course, one is that the sort of manner in which uh, Kachatibu was demarcated uh, in favor of Sri Lanka, that is brought out uh, in the minutes of the meeting that uh, was held to brief uh, DMK, uh, you know, leader and patriarch uh, Karnanidhi ji uh, by the then foreign secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. And, uh, and of course, uh, the second issue is in the context, today's context, when you see uh, the enormous amount of, uh, let us say, uh, costs that it has, uh, you know, uh, impacted in terms of the uh, uh, fishermen and those who rely on fishing uh, for a livelihood in our country. Uh, and of course, as I said, the strategic space. I can elaborate in more detail, but that's a long answer to your short question. Why is this island so important for India's maritime and economic zone? Let's start with the, uh, you know, strategic and security significance. Because, you know, this is an island which is, uh, you know, it, it's a small island and various people, including Prime Minister Nehru and Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, have referred to it as, a, uh, you know, a little rock or a small island. The fact of the matter is that it's very close uh, to your, uh, you know, shoreline or coastline, only 12 nautical miles. Second issue is that if you see the papers that have been released as a result of the RTI, uh, and the briefing that the Foreign Secretary, then Foreign Secretary, made to Karnanidhi ji, it brings out uh, the fact that there was a risk of some concessions for oil exploration and exploitation being given by the then Sri Lankan government to Chinese uh, interests. And that would have posed, obviously, a serious issue for India. Uh, but my question is that if you knew that there was such, uh, there was such risks and there were such uh, potentials for uh, a possible third party to get involved close to your shoreline, um, then why did you uh, demarcate it in favor of Sri Lanka? That was every reason for you to keep it. And Billy, I mean, if you look at all the records, there was absolutely no reason as a negotiator, as someone who dealt extensively with Sri Lanka myself, there's absolutely no reason to give Kachatibu to Sri Lanka. And I mean, 
there is no mitigating factor. People have said all sorts of reasons. They've said that it was to facilitate the return of Indian origin Tamils back to India. It, you know, we got the watch bank. But Indian origin Tamils have been living there for a very long time, working in uh, Sri Lanka in 1947, and subsequently their status was unsure. Many of them wanted to be nationalized citizens in Sri Lanka where they were living for generations. And our effort was to enable them to be nationalized where they were, as per their wishes and desires. Those who wanted to come back came back to India. This agreement will not facilitate anything. I mean, if you want to come back to India, what is stopping? I mean, Sri, Lanka, Sri Lanka is hardly going to stop you uh, coming back. The second thing about the Watch Bank, which is basically west of Sri Lanka and you know far closer to the Indian shoreline and quite far from the Sri Lankan coastline. People, I mean, I think I've read reports that Watch Bank was handed over as a result of the Kachati Way. I don't think there's any linkage. Uh, Foreign Secretary Cable Singh's briefing to Karunanadi makes no reference of Watch Bank. Watch Bank was was you know became part of the of India under the maritime agreement included in. 1976, so two years after this Kachati Wave. So I don't think there's a link. On the contrary, what you've done basically is that you've, you've actually compromised the security by having an island or a place, uh, you know, 12 miles away from your shoreline become the boundary, a maritime boundary between India and Sri Lanka. That means anything beyond that is something that Sri Lanka can legitimately either give out to third parties, you know, concessions or oil exploration exploitation. If they knew that danger was there and that that imminent risk was there in 1974, why did they not keep Kachatibu with India? Why did they compromise India's security and territorial, I mean, in, in many senses, integrity uh, by actually demarcating Kachatibu in favor of Sri Lanka? Even that is, even now, I cannot really think of a plausible reason why Mrs. Gandhi did that. And in doing so, I think you have compromised, and as that to answer your question, our both our economic and strategic strategic interests. Uh, you know, it's 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 actually a very indefensible act, and I'm so glad. I mean, because I've dealt with it since 2011 uh, as the Joint Secretary dealing with the neighbourhood. We had many court cases. Uh, you know, there were Parliament questions. The DMK was very aggressive about this issue. But the fact of the matter is that the truth has to come out and there is complete transparency in disclosing all of this documentation in the public domain after 50 years of that particular agreement. And what is very clear is that the DMK that has been the most, uh, I would say, vociferous on this issue in parliament and outside in the legal, uh, in the legal domain, uh, saying that uh, Kachati should be returned to India and that our fishermen's uh, livelihoods are affected. Uh, is the party which acquiesced in this entire agreement? I mean, if if, if their uh, founder, if their chairman, and and you know their patriarch uh, Karnanidhi ji, actually uh, you know concurred informally, uh, sort of acquiesced in this uh, agreement going through, they means that the party and uh, you know some of the top people knew all along that DMK was part of that deal, and so it is a double standard to actually agree to Kachati were going to Sri Lanka and then today demanding that Kachati will be brought uh, back into India and that the fishermen livelihoods issues are addressed. I think this is an important point that the people of Tamil Nadu, particularly, uh, you know, a lot of people whose livelihoods are affected, they needs to take into account and needs to question this. And uh, so I feel that uh, this, this issue is uh, very pertinent and very timely because, you know, people have to know at the right time and people have to base their verdict on, uh, you know, uh, such disclosures uh, where uh, decisions taken by those that they've reposed confidence in, whether it is the Congress government of uh, uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi or the DMK government of Karnanidhi ji, uh, the current uh, governments and the current uh, uh, parties have to take into account the fact that uh, these were not only wrong decisions, but they have severe implications to the people. And I think there is also an attempt to misdeed, which is even worse. What do the numbers tell us? How many Indian fishermen are now being detained or harassed by the Sri Lankan Coast Guard and the Navy on a yearly basis? Uh, External Affairs Minister Dr. Jayashankar said that uh, in the last 10 years, over 6,000 Indian fishermen had been held in Sri Lankan custody and over 1,000 boats were, were actually confiscated uh, by Sri Lankan authorities. And recently, uh, you know, uh, I, one of our uh, fishermen was charged uh, 10 million rupees 
uh, by a Sri Lankan port, uh, you know, for fishing in these waters. So it is increasingly difficult for our people to earn their livelihoods. And I mean, Kachatibu is not a question of fishing, you know, where Kachatibu is. If Kachatibu was part of India, our uh, exclusive economic zone would have extended much further away. That means we would have had a much greater part of the park, uh, the park uh, bay, uh, for our fishermen to to fish in, and I think uh, this would have been a satisfactory outcome. And today, I think the sort of tensions that we see between fisher folk, uh, you know, in India and Sri Lanka, between uh, in the governments of India and Sri Lanka, this is an unnecessary irritant in the relationship, which could have been avoided had the right decision been taken in 1974. And I again come back to my same point that had it been Prime Minister Modi in 1974, he would have never taken such a decision because he would have acted in the interest, in the supreme interest of the people of India and in, 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 in line with his policy of Bharat first. There's no question of compromising on your national interests when it comes to such negotiations and some so-called give and take. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, there is, if you can see the contrast between the way uh, you know, foreign policy and, uh, you know, decisions were taken uh, at a certain time by the Congress uh, uh, government and today's context where decisions are taken in a very considered manner and in a manner that uh, reflects the will and the best interests of the people of India. Now, some individuals are now claiming that the Kachativu Island was an exchange deal over Vaj Bank, uh, Bank which is on the continental shelf south of uh, Indira Point. Now, do we have any such records to the best of your knowledge? Respond to this a little earlier when I said that, you know, when the foreign, then Foreign Secretary of India, Keval Singh, he was accompanied by a director in the historic division called Basu. They briefed Karunanidhiji in great detail in Chennai and then Madras and, uh, you know, spoke to him of all the possible implications of, of the deal. Why do they want to go ahead with this? What are the imperatives? What are the reasons to go ahead? And they spoke about the fact that there was a danger of, you know, uh, the Sri Lankans taking it to the International Court of Justice, Sri Lankans taking it to the UN, Sri Lankans uh, possibly giving oil concessions to Chinese interests close to our maritime boundary, etc. If this issue was not settled. But at no, at no point, I think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, did, did the Watch Bank issue come up. Watch Bank only came up in 1976, two years down the line, uh, when an agreement was signed, you know, uh, a maritime boundary was demarcated where uh, Watch Bank became part of India. And uh, so from that point of view, I don't think Watch Bank was, uh, was uh, an issue at all in the negotiations. Uh, Keval Singh, Foreign Secretary Keval Singh only refers to, as I said, only economic interests and the concern that Sri Lanka might take this issue internationally. Uh, but but uh, certainly, I don't think there was any quid pro quo of any other reason. And if there's any other reason, it's not it's not evident to us. Today, people are only ex extrapolating. People are guessing. Uh, people are making certain hypotheses, but it's not borne out by fact. Now, was it an economic and strategic error in hindsight to cede Kachativu? So I would not use the word cede because it was a it was an agreement to demarcate the boundary. You only cede if it's part of your territory. So officially, until you demarcate the boundary, you know, it's neither yours nor anybody else's. Basically, you're drawing a line and that line can bring areas within your boundary or within someone else's boundary. So this line was drawn. So Kachatibu was what the Sri Lankan side. So it was demarcated in favor of Sri Lanka. And I think uh, from that perspective, uh, I think it was it was clearly a, a wrong decision. I would call it a historic injustice uh, to the people of India today that Kachatibu was actually demarcated in favor of Sri Lanka uh, because many of the problems that we face today in terms of economic li livelihood of our fishermen, uh, the irritants that we have in the India-Sri Lanka relationship, uh, and of course, the possible strategic implications of having, uh, you know, an island so close to your mainland, so close to your coastal, uh, you know, to your coastline uh, with, uh, you know, another country that could well actually, uh, you know, farm out that area for oil exploration, other, you know, wind energy, may, many other reasons to uh, third country interests that are, may not be, uh, that may be inhibited, that may have, uh, you know, uh, negative intentions and designs. So it has a serious security implication, which I'm sure uh, the government at the time uh, was aware of. They were aware of all these implications, but yet took a decision by calling it a uh, you know, small rock, you know, a little island or whatever, 
and uh, and i think uh, i think that uh, is uh, today coming out and uh, this is something that people have to really take a verdict on uh, as to you know uh, the i would say uh, injustice of right now what according to you should be a provision and is there a possibility to claim the island back international uh, you know agreements uh, especially with relate with relate to boundary uh, are uh, sort of uh, you know um, uh, not uh, very easy to roll back because it involves uh, possibly you lodge some of the you not only rat state ratified but you also lodge it in the un and uh, other bodies so that uh, you know that demarcation is something that is available internationally uh, but dr jay shankar external affairs minister i think uh, very very correctly stated yesterday that we could open a dialogue with sri lanka on the issue of fishing rights uh, in and around kachati and i think that is something that certainly can be explored and i think uh, the fact is that we have a very good relationship with sri lanka uh, we enjoy uh, you know a very close return of bonds and uh, we would have to work on that relationship to ensure that uh, there is no adverse impact uh, you know in on our relationship on account of this uh, i would say uh, historic uh, um, you know uh, error on our part but does that does not absolve uh, the you know decision makers uh, the leaders of our country at that time uh, especially uh, you know uh, the congress government which is uh, at the helm of power which took decisions in a very uh, you know unilateral and arbitrary manner uh, for taking a step that today uh, we have to contend with as a clearly uh, wrong decision and uh, as i said i mean uh, historic injustice uh, to uh, the people of our country so then how do we prevent the harassment of our fishermen in this area we have to as i said we have to work with the sri lankan side to ensure that there is more access uh, if uh, you know uh, as dr jay shankar mentioned we could get them to uh, you know uh, give uh, grant greater fishing rights uh, to our fishermen uh, in the waters around kachatibu uh, you know provide more access to our fishermen that would be one important step and of course uh, we continue to work to ensure that uh, you know the pork bay is looked at as a as a you know a uh, natural resource for both countries and that both countries can exploit this resource in a manner that is uh, in their best mutual interest uh, you know sort of a lit live and let live policy uh, and i think there has to be more give and take in this regard and i i'm sure this is something that uh, we have been discussing in the past we'll continue to discuss and i believe it is not insurmountable we can you know address these issues there will of course be the tensions that we do see but we have to minimize those tensions and minimize the friction and uh, you know maximize the uh, ability to work uh, in cooperation and harmony uh, with uh, with fisher folk on the other side and many steps in that regard uh, are possible thank you harsh singla for joining us on the telecast sharing your views and giving us an analysis of what actually happened in 1974 and then in 1976 for more such videos subscribe to the newsx youtube channel hit the bell icon